This December, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol will light up the stage at Orlando Shakes. The miserly Ebenezer Scrooge greets each Christmas with a bar humbug until he's visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. Experience the iconic tale of one man's chance to change for the better. Gather together to witness the holiday magic and create a tradition for the whole family. Don't miss A Christmas Carol live on stage at Orlando Shakes, December 1st through the 24th. Tickets at orlandoshakes.org. Hello and welcome to this Orlando Shakes special presentation on Facebook Live and YouTube, our live streamed Q&A with the creative team of A Christmas Carol. I'm Douglas Love Ramos, Managing Director at Orlando Shakes, and tonight just sit back and relax and learn about some of the people behind the scenes of our latest production of the season, A Christmas Carol, which kicks off tomorrow night at the Lounge Shakespeare Center in the Margeson Theater. Also, we would love for you to join in on the conversation from wherever you are. Leave us your questions about the production in the comments section, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to two members of the creative team of A Christmas Carol. First, uh, please welcome the director and author of the adaptation of A Christmas Carol, and our artistic director, Jim Helsinger. Hello, nice, nice to be here. Nice to see you. Next, let me introduce to you our costume designer, who is also the costume shop manager at Orlando Shakes. Please welcome Mel Barger. Hi, Mel. Hello. Thank you both for taking the time to join us this evening. We know you're busy preparing for our opening night tomorrow night. We've been doing some uh, preview performances that have been going really well, and we are so excited to to launch this production. Um, I'm going to start with you, Jim. Uh, there's so many things to talk about here. Uh, you've you um, have been working on this since um, you know for quite a while now, and the adaptation. So when you approach the uh, a, a piece like a Christmas Carol, a classic like this. Language is so important to what we value at Orlando Shakes. How did you approach this particular uh, text? And what's unique about your adaptation and, and uh, you know, just how you got from the page to the script page? Well, um, uh, uh, here at Orlando Shakes, language is important. We are a Shakespeare theater, so... Um, knowing and, and using text is really, really important to us. So when we, uh, when I'm looking at adapting really any book into a play and adapt, adapted a number, I'm really trying to get the experience on stage of the highlights of when I was reading the book. Mm. And uh, what's so wonderful about Dickens is not only the plot, the stories, the names of all the characters, which are, we have a name like Scrooge for a really <laughs> bad guy and Bob Cratchit for the poor little, you know, underdog. Um, they're great names. But what really makes Dickens stand out so much is his narration and description of things. And I think it's very easy to do a stage adaptation and lose all that wonderful narration and, and, and dialogue that is not dialogue, but uh, descriptions of things. So what we have is a production very similar to Nicholas Nickleby that we did a number of years ago, which is also a Dickens piece where the characters narrate as they go. So you might have somebody say, he didn't think this, and then he just talks as the character. So th there's, a, there's an attempt to try to get the Dickens part of it without having a narrator, but having the whole cast as a group, as an ensemble. So our thought is that we're in 1842 when the show was first came out and was published and that this uh, group is performing it and they're an ensemble playing all the parts as we go along. So there's a lot of that beautiful and funny, funny narration from Dickens built into it. 
And then we can go into some of the other stuff. But the first thing I would start is hearing the Dickens language. And then the next, as we segue, would be the carols themselves and what we did with all the music. That's great. So, you know, um, what surprises did you have in the rehearsal? You know, what, what you're you're working from the the page to the to um, the the page of Dickens' original work to your adaptation, and then to the stage. What what is that trajectory like? What what surprised you? What um, uh, did you experience? How how did the script evolve in your rehearsal process? Um, I think two things really jumped out at me as we were in rehearsals. Uh, one was how great this cast is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really expecting a long, hard slog when we're rehearsing the play. It's a very complicated play. There's a lot of music in it. There's a lot of scene changes. Was There's ghosts, there's magic, there's fog, there's twinkle lights and all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, the actors were so on right from the very beginning that it just went very well very early. Um, and the other is how poignant the story is, no matter when you tell it, this is why the story has lasted so long, is no matter where we are in time, it speaks to us today. Hmm. I think that one of the things it's talking about is the division between the rich and the poor. And that's a thing that we are experiencing in America right now, is the poor and the needy who are not getting help and not being assisted even at Christmas time uh, mm -hmm. by the Scrooges of the world who say, I pay taxes and that's enough. I don't wanna support nonprofits. I don't wanna support anybody else. I don't wanna give a helping hand to somebody even at Christmas time. And it, it's just so poignant to hear it and go, oh yeah, that's, that's where we are and, and that's me. And then personally for me, there was a moment in it when uh, um, they're talking about Mr. Fezziwig who was very kind to Scrooge uh, when he was very young. And he said, the, uh, the spirit says, well, you didn't spend a lot of money uh, on this Christmas party. And he goes, well, it wasn't about the money. It was about the fact that this guy was nice to us. He was in a position of authority. And what he said to us, one word or one phrase could make such a difference in our lives at Christmas time, all the time. And I have to hear that as the artistic director and the director of the play that the, the simplest thing that I say or do, or that any of us say or do, particularly if we are in a, a, a position of privilege, has a profound effect on others. And we should remember at Christmas time and at all the time to be talking to people with love and with kindness because it gets remembered and it gets passed on to other people. So that was what I was hearing uh, as I was directing the play is, be nice, be kind, give, to other people, that's what they remember. That's great. And uh, just so everyone else remembers that you are watching this live on Thursday, December 2nd. And uh, if you are watching live, type a question in the comments section below and we'll do our best to get to it. Mel, you designed the costumes for this production and you've designed so many uh, productions at Orlando Shakes. And we're so lucky to have you. Uh, tell me, how do you approach a design of a production so big? You're not only designing for the, how many actors in the show? 17, is that what we finally came to in this one? So we have so many just actors, but then they're all playing so many multiple roles on top of that, need different looks and different costumes. And these, you know, it's not just a different hat. It's, you know, these are some big costumes that are involved. What's your approach? I uh, take a somewhat unique approach in that I look at um, the changes that need to happen, all the characters that we need to have, and almost work backwards of um, knowing that we need to do the quick changes and we need to change from one look to another. And how can we layer up? Can we use the same pair of pants for multiple looks and add on um, jackets and hats and coats and change the change the ties and things to make uh, make that happen? And then go look in our stock. Uh, I have the blessing of being the shop manager here as well. So that means I have free reign over our stock to spend as much time in it as I want and pull from shows like Nicholas Nickleby and, um, and 
former uh, other versions of Christmas Carol that we've done here and whatnot, and um, find as many elements as I can that are in our stock that we can work with, and then supplement that with unique pieces that we can build. Uh, so for this for this one, we added a lot of children to the show that we haven't done before, and uh, that gave us the opportunity to build some really fun pieces for the children and um, that help us tell time period and things like that very well. And um, then we, uh, I do all of that research. I uh, look at books, I Google uh, hairstyles and things like that. Um, and then we start meeting as a design team and present options and whittle things down until we get a, a really lovely cohesive look that, that where the costumes and the set and everything um, just look gorgeous together. And they look gorgeous as someone who is not part of the creative team of this show. It is so beautiful. And uh, from, from someone enjoying it from the audience. Uh, we have our first question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Philip asks, what costume design hurdles or problems are particular to this adaptation? And how did Mel solve these problems? <laughs> Um, one of those big hurdles was this is a very fast paced show and the changes from one character to another happen really quickly from scene to scene. And um, so that was a, a big hurdle for us. And part of that was figuring out layering and small components that could give a different look. But it was also, uh, we have a wonderful backstage crew. We have uh, two fabulous wardrobe personnel that uh, do not stop to breathe or get a drink uh, or anything the entire, uh, the entire show, particularly act two. Um, and they have been working on the show for three weeks now, planning out all of those changes, where everything is going to be backstage, how to move things from one place to another for those actors to make those changes happen. And that was a big hurdle. I bet. And, and it's really seamless. Um, Jim, music is such an important part of this production. And it really was from the very beginning of an early draft of your adaptation um, that I was able to read. You were, you were, you know, really wanting to weave the music as a, as a integral part of um, the fabric of, of the experience. Uh, tell us about that and tell us about how we achieved that. Well, um, I mean, the title of the play is A Christmas Carol, right? So we really wanted carols and Christmas songs to be a part of it. I really wanted the experience of when someone saw the show, they not only at the end saw the plot, saw the redemption, was a part of the comedy, but also felt like, wow, I heard all my favorite Christmas songs as well. Uh, incredibly well done. So we sing five full Christmas carols uh, during the course of the play in the bleak midwinter, deck the halls. Oh, Holy Night, uh, We Three Kings, and We Wish You a Merry Christmas. And then there are about another 20 um, that we have snippets of through the course. And not only do people sing lines of it throughout, but also Michael Andrew, who wrote all the original orchestrations for this, weaves them in throughout the entire play. So these themes and Christmas carols keep coming back along the way. So I think that it is uh, unique and fun in that it not only is a play experience, it is also a musical experience of getting to hear all these wonderful carols at Christmas. And they're all themed to a particular moment in the show. In the bleak midwinter, we start with, because it's cold, it's snowing, and, and we're poor. We start uh, in, not in a good place uh, on Christmas Eve with a non-believer um, who is against Christmas. And then we build ourselves all the way up to, we wish you a Merry Christmas at the end. So it's been really a joy to, uh, to put all the singing and the harmonies uh, in along the way. And you've also incorporated a live cello on stage. Yes. Which is um, so delight. It's just, it's, it just fills you up and it creates a, a feeling in that theater that is, is, that brings you right into that time period. Um, was that your, your goal with, with that instrument uh, selection? Yeah, when I began uh, uh, talking to uh, Michael Andrew about it, and we said, well, there's a big orchestra, we'll need tracks for that, we can't afford a 20-piece orchestra, and, and there's no room to put them on our stage. Um, what can we do, how will we do it? We just started talking about how, for both of us, we brought it up independently in our own thoughts. The cello is the closest to the emotions, I think, that humans hit and the human voice. 
Um, it's not so low as a bass, it's not so high as a violin. Um, and it just really touches your heart. Um, one of the things I've loved about the cello is we were all set to mic it and we don't need to. Uh, mm. Sound in our theater is beautiful, totally acoustic uh, with the actors. And as you said, it really fills that space. And I think uh, literally uh, when we say it moved me, you know, uh, when a note is played, the bones inside of us and our heart literally move uh, to that vibration. And I think we feel that quite a few times. It's it's really beautiful, the underscoring and the may, main playing during the uh, carols. And uh, Jean-Marie Glazier, who's playing it, is really great um, and has just been wonderful in the whole rehearsal process. It's really beautiful. And it's just, just great to hear live music. Yes. Yes. Mel, when you, um, um, you know, we've had, we've been acting, we've been rehearsing, I should say, for several weeks now. And uh, you get the names and sizes of the actors um, just a few weeks before then. Um, how do you make sure, I mean, everything just looks so perfect on, so fitted on everyone. How do you make sure that that happens? What is that process like? Or when you know, and how soon are you working on that kind of stuff? So uh, the show came into the shop about four weeks ago, and um, we I was working further ahead than that, uh, trying to pull things that were similar in size or order in um, pants and, and shirts that were similar in size to our actors. And then four weeks ago, our actors uh, showed started showing up, and we have. Uh, hour long fittings with them. Most of the actors we had two one hour fittings with uh, over the course of those those four weeks and um, fit all of the garments. And then we have a fabulous team in here uh, in our costume shop that uh, do all immense amount of alterations and builds and adjust hymns and make everything just just as gorgeous as you're seeing there on screen. Um, it's a huge team in here working. Uh, we have several full-time staff members and brought in a bunch of additional crew members just to help with this particular show. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of work, uh, a lot of hours back in this in the shop to make this happen. Yeah, I, you know, I was talking the other day to Roberta who plays Mrs. Cratchit. And um, she also plays the charity collector in the, in the beginning. And she, <laughs> she was in the, the hallway, the, the, what we call the VOM, going into the, um, you know, waiting for her entrance into the, the show. And I said, you look so beautiful in that, in that dress. I mean, it's big hoop skirts and corsets and petticoats. And she said, I love it. It makes me feel so great. It is so heavy. <laughs> Some of those, I mean, that's that's got to be what, a 15 pound dress that she's wearing there? Absolutely. It's heavy upholstery fabrics. She's wearing a sofa. She's wearing layers and layers of ruffled sofa over this incredibly lightweight hoop skirt that keeps it all out, um, which saved us from stacking layers and layers of petticoats on her. And yeah. uh, it's the first time we've gotten hoop skirts on our stage, which is a lot of fun in particular right now with social distancing, because the two ladies wearing them were joking backstage because no one can get within six feet of them because of their hoop skirts. <laughs> that's um, right. Well, that's right. It's They had social distancing back then. And there we are. See this picture right here on the right on, uh, well, on the right on my camera, the red hat. Um, that's Roberta wearing her sofa. <laughs> uh, but it's so beautiful in real life. And that's what's, uh, you know, a, a number of the preview audience uh, members, they, they, they tell me two things. They, they've been saying, oh, you, you sang my favorite Christmas carol. And of course, it's different for everybody. So we've done, we've, we, we sing so many of them that we are bound to hit your favorite. But also, um, you know, we're, we're pretty close up uh, at Orlando Shakes. It's an intimate feeling theater. And um, you can see the, the detail in the costumes and everyone is raving about them. So congratulations on that. I can't wait for everybody to see them during this run. Um, and uh, Jim, if there is something that uh, we should be sure to watch for and, and uh, you know, that, that, or a favorite part of, of this particular production that, that uh, is for you. We have all of these puppets and special effects. What should we look out for? Um, a couple, a couple things that I think are 
unique and fun to this production I haven't seen before. One is uh, not only, you know, Marley comes out and he has the chains. Um, and I think people are very used to that. And he's uh, talking to Scrooge about the ghosts are going to visit you. And then a point that's often cut from other productions is he says, come to the window. And they look out and they see all of the other ghosts like um, uh, uh, Marley himself that are out in the world. And we have these wonderful, they're actually kites that fly in and around the audience. We saw one in one of the earlier pictures that are flying by as he's saying, I see all these phantoms. I see them everywhere. It's really just a fun, fun, fun moment. And uh, we were kind of iffy in the, you know, when we were brainstorming of, well, let's try it. We'll, we'll see. I don't know if a kite's going to look good or not. And it, I'm just thrilled with it. It's just really fun. And then the other, and this is really right um, out of the book, is he is he's faced his own tombstone, Ebenezer Scrooge, and knows that he is going to die. And he's saying to the ghost of future, are these the things that will be or the things that may be? Can I change my future? Let me write out that writing on that stone where it says Ebenezer Scrooge and I'm dead. And then he falls into the grave and wakes up in his own bed. And we were like, okay, how do we do that live on stage? And actually it's exactly what we do. A big grave opens up in front of him. He falls down into the grave. You see him fall. And actually it is his real bed rising up on an elevator and raises him right back up. And then he's at his bed. And that's just a moment. I just, it, that was my experience reading. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> he's in his own bed. It's okay. It's all all right. You know, it's, I mean, I, I it was just a dream. Um, and I think we've really achieved that. So those are two. Oh, that's mad. And who hasn't had that dream? <laughs> um, so um, we have another question that came in. Why don't we uh, see what that is? Philip says, how do you make the audience feel anxiety or fear when telling a ghost story? Is there a bag of theatrical tricks to scare audiences in live performance? So uh, I think we we talked a little bit about that just now and lots of lots of puppets and things. You want to talk a little bit more about the ghost puppets? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think one thing I mean, it, it's right from Halloween to Christmas. And we, and we have to remember that, you know, it's not really an American tradition, but a British tradition is telling ghost stories on Christmas Eve. And that's a lot of where the Dickens wrote a number of them. Christmas Carol is not the only one. There's the cricket on the hearth and, and others that were traditions of telling ghost stories at Christmas. So, yeah, it, it, it you know, I think we go Christmas Carol, it's all light, but there are four ghosts in it. And they're all kind of different, some not so scary, but some very scary. And I think some of the tricks that we're doing is, of course, fog. We always love to see fog come out. And another thing that actor, the audiences may not know the name of it, but what we call haze is in the air as well. And when there are little droplets in the air, like when it's misty out, you really see the streams of light coming through, right? The light has to have something to reflect on. So you can see the haze in this production around him, uh, Marley here as he's out in his chains all around. So that's part of what creates the mood and the lighting of the, there's two of the kites flying around right there you can see that create that. And then there's the, you know, we put echo on the voice and reverb on the voice. And, uh, you know, we jump out and surprise you a little bit as well, because we're all surprised by that. So I think there's a number of that. And then I think the biggest, the most intimidating of all is the ghost of Christmas yet to come, the future. And it is 14 feet tall. It is just freaking huge, floating <laughs> over top of him. Um, and uh, uh, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some of the tricks that we're using. It's incredible. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, Mel, if there's one thing that we should look look for in, in your work, um, <laughs> What should we keep? What should we keep our eyes peeled and not to miss? Um, well, I personally love all of the ghosts. Uh, the what we've created for all of our ghosts is fabulous, uh, and uh, like you were saying, just a lot of the details. But um, if you are close enough, uh, something I'm very proud of that very few people will probably notice um, when you're staring at Marley and all of his chains making a huge ruckus. Uh, check out his fingernails. He has got some fabulous, um, just 
skin falling off, dead looking oh fingers God. and fingernails. And it's a pair of gloves that we've created here in our shop and painted up the fingernails so he can put them on quick and take them off because he becomes Fezzy Wig very shortly after he leaves the stages Marley. And um, those fingernails are really fun. <laughs> <laughs> this show is really fun. And I know that you're all going to love it. Thank you so much for being with us tonight for this special Q&A, special peek behind the scenes at uh, our um, current production of A Christmas Carol. And just so everyone knows, A Christmas Carol runs until December 24th at Orlando Shakes. And uh, we're not just providing a fantastic production on stage. We also have a holiday selfie wonderland, we're calling it, that's open one hour before the show. All kinds of fun, beautiful, de decorated trees and little settings to take selfies in uh, that you'll want to put on all of your social media. And we have a hot chocolate bar and fresh baked cookies and illuminated Christmas trees and photo opportunities throughout our decorated lobby. Uh, order your tickets today. They're going fast. We are filling up quite a bit. Um, and uh, so you'll want to get your tickets as soon as possible at orlandoshakes.org. And we wholeheartedly want to thank our sponsors, because we know, as we say at Orlando Shakes, without our sponsors, there would be no show. So thank you very much to our title sponsor, Holland and Knight LLP, and our supporting sponsors, Dr. Phillips Charities, Publix Charities, Raymond James Financial, and Parkway, and our patron sponsor, Advent Health and Orange County Government for their Arts and Cultural Affairs program. Thank you all for supporting this production. Don't miss our opening night in-person pre-show talk tomorrow, Friday, December 3rd at 6.30, an hour before our show goes on. And we have a post-show talk back with some cast members and, and other creatives on, on the show Sunday, December 19th. So if you have um, tickets to the performance tomorrow. Come early and see us uh, talk a little bit more about behind the scenes of the show. And if you're seeing the show on Sunday the 19th, if you get tickets for that show, you can stay and talk to some of the cast members after. Please remember when you come to Orlando Shakes to wear your face masks inside the building. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mel. And thank you. We want to um, uh, continue to bring these behind the scenes looks at uh, our shows for every production that we do. But we look forward especially to welcoming you this month to A Christmas Carol. We look forward to seeing you at our theater. We'll see you at Orlando Shakes. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Thanks, guys.